Hello, my name is Martin, and welcome back to another video. Thank you very much, Ralph, for that intro. So, the idea behind this week's video, or this week's story, started off with a text message from my nephew, of all people. Um, it was a text message and a picture, but we'll come to that. First off, I've got something to address from the last video. Uh, the, the lack of footage of Ringley, of the clock tower and the stocks. I found myself back there during ongoing investigations during the week. I found myself back at Ringley, so I took my little camera along and then got you some better footage of the, uh, the clock tower and the stocks. So first off, let's go to Ringley and I'll show you what we saw. So here you go, I owed you some better detailed shots of the bridge that I showed you in the last video. It's not sunny today and, and you can see the waters of the Irwell are a bit higher. Uh, but here's a bit more detail. Uh, this is Ringley Bridge, built in 1677 in the village of Ringley, just outside Manchester and Salford. Um, I was down there, I had to go back down there, I took a couple of friends down there. Like I say, ongoing investigations of the stuff we're looking at in that area. That's a different, the other side of the bridge, and I definitely owed you a better view of the stocks. There's the stocks. Bit difficult to film these because they're behind a fence. I wonder if that wood's original. Hmm, not sure. I should have filmed that plaque for you, but it just basically said that these were the stocks. <laughs> and there's a little um, lone standing clock tower. This clock tower is from a church that was built in 1826 and since demolished. This is the rear side of it. There's the access point. There's the front of it, as you can see, and there's some um, words and, in, and inscriptions there. I'll give you a bit of a close-up of those. Uh, there's a close-up. You can pause that if you want to read it, but it's uh, there was an original church there in 1625, then another one built in 1826, and then another one built since that, if you see the other video. Also, I had a comment about this clock tower. Let me read this comment for you. There you go, a very dodgy picture of the comment section of my channel, but Nigel must live in the area or know this clock tower because he writes, the clock tower was fully refurbished in 2016-2017 at a cost of £85,000 and is maintained in good working order. So thank you very much, Nigel Butterworth, for that information. Right, so there you go, some better pictures of uh, Ringley for you, some more detail on the bridge, the stocks and the lone standing clock tower. Now, if you're wondering what video I'm talking about, because I'm looking back to a previous video here, it's this video here um, that was, was the last video I did, and I didn't get some proper detail of the, the village, the features in the village that you've just seen. So a little bit of a recap for you. Also, these things always come to light after the video. I do these, uh, I got, as much as I spend a lot of effort going out into the woods and looking for bricks and remains, I don't find the, the bang of pictures, do I? So somebody sent me a picture after the last video of, remember Radcliffe Power Station? I went looking in all the undergrowth for the power station and I filmed loads of footage of that quest to find the power station. In the end, I had to just cut loads of it out because it literally was just me in the undergrowth and I got lost. But anyway, somebody sent me a picture after the video. Uh, I've got it here. It's... Uh, Stephen, Stephen Perks sent me a, a link to a picture of the, uh, the power station being built. Now here's the picture. As you can see, it's a bit of a, it's not a particularly crisp, clear photograph, but if this is what I think it is, this is amazing. So I think we're standing with the river behind us and we're looking to the site of the old Radcliffe power station. It was built in 1905, so this is like way, way back. And up on the hill in the background, I think we're looking at Outward Colliery. I think we are. That whole area is now completely forested. Um, obviously back then there wasn't as much vegetation and undergrowth. Now it's a beauty sort of beauty area, nature reserve, and it's full of trees, but that's how it used to look. 
banging picture. Just wish it was a little bit sharper. It's not Stephen's picture. I think he found it, but thank you, Stephen. He also sent another link to another picture. Here's a picture of um, Outward Colliery. Um, great picture. Look at that. Um, there's the sidings that we're trying to find. This has all been landscaped now. So where you're looking at the sidings and the colliery buildings, that's all just been, I think it's been covered in earth. Um, but I think we found the entrance to the sidings, but I think it's been obviously ploughed over now. But uh, a really good shot of outward colliery there. So let's crack on with the video. I said at the beginning of the video, this is the, the story starts with a text message. And indeed, it does start with a text message. The text message was from my nephew. He lives uh, just outside Manchester city centre, over the River Irwell, in Salford, in an apartment, a very nice apartment. And he walks uh, into Manchester city centre, over the River Irwell, a short journey, and he goes into the city centre to do shopping, to go to the gym and all the rest of it. One particular day he walks past a building site and he takes a picture of something that he sees in the excavations and sends it to me and says, do you know what this is, Martin? Looks old. Uh, and I said to him, where's that? And he said, it's near Deansgate. Now, when he said it's near Deansgate and looking at what it was, <laughs> I nearly passed out because I thought it was something else, but it turns out it wasn't that. So I get up off the floor when I realise that it wasn't what I thought it was. I know that's a bit dramatic, but <laughs> it's the way I am. Anyway, it turns out it wasn't near Dean's Gate. It was just across the River Irwell in Salford. And I said, right, you need to take me there and show me where it is. And I need to go and have a look myself. So sure enough, we meet up and he shows me this building site. And I get some better footage for you. Now, what was it? Okay, so this was the remains of Manchester's New Bailey Prison. Now, some of you who know Manchester may be familiar with uh, Strangeways Prison, which itself is a very old prison dating from the, uh, the mid-1800s. But New Bailey was the prison that preceded that one, and Strangeways was built to replace New Bailey. So what we're looking at is the I think is the remains of New Bailey Prison. In fact, it is the remains of the prison because there have been other excavations on the site. So it got me looking into this prison and more so what, what spurred me on was because a week later, the remains you're looking at had completely gone. So I thought I need to tell the story of New Bailey Prison, at least on my videos. I won't be the first one to tell the story but I need to look into a little bit to the history of this place, this prison that was built in the 1700s. So that's the original picture my nephew sent me. And so I went down to take a closer look. Now I'm filming just on the other side of a fence here, but I zoomed in with my camera and look at that old arch there. Um, fantastic when you think how old that possibly is. Now, as you look at the back there, there's some concrete sort of, stanchions that just come right through the floor of the prison from something there that was previously there. Um, here's another view. On the right there, you've got like a little uh, brick road or a brick floor. And then again, you'll see our archway. I'm going to zoom in on that archway on this next one. A bit dodgy footage. As you zoom in, it looks like another tunnel underneath it a curved tunnel but that's what I filmed and that's what is now gone but fantastic to see all that so yes it was the New Bailey prison now I don't know if some of you have been to Manchester but we've got a great big old Victorian prison called Strangeways and it's truly a foreboding building to be honest with you uh, that was opened in 1868 but New Bailey precedes it so the foundation stone for the New Bailey Prison was laid on the 22nd of May in 1787. It was laid by Thomas Butterworth Bailey. And yes, I am reading this because I've had to make lots of written notes. <laughs> um, it had male and female blocks. Now the prisoners tended to be, uh, that were held there, tended to be for more minor offences because capital offences went all the way up to Lancaster and they were held there. 
Some of the uh, people from the Peterloo Massacre were held at the New Bailey Prison just for a short time. Another famous prisoner in there was Abel Haywood. Remember when we did the videos about the town hall? The bell was named after one of the mayors of Manchester, the Lord Mayors of Manchester, who was Abel Haywood. Well, Abel Haywood was a bit of a rebel in his, in his youth, and he was arrested uh, for refusing to pay a fine for selling unstamped newspapers. I think this was something to do with uh, the press being regulated and Abel Haywood was selling newspapers from um, sources that the government didn't like. Anyway, he was imprisoned at New Bailey for a short time. Abel Haywood later went on to become the Lord Mayor of Manchester and like I say, the bell that chimes across the city uh, all the bongs across the city is named after him. So there you go. Uh, the prison also had a treadmill that they found during the excavations. Um, like I say, these excavations I am looking at now are kind of later. Uh, a couple of years ago, earlier excavations were found when they were doing some more building work in the area. Here's a picture of, uh, of the previous excavations. But uh, they also found a treadmill that was initially used, uh, they put the prisoners on it, and it was initially used to, to grind dye wood. But apparently later on, uh, they gave up that, and they just put the prisoners on the treadmill just for hard labour. And some of them was there, were there on it for like 10 hours a day, apparently. But you get different views of the prison. Um, another view, that, uh, another account that I read was that... Um, the prison regime wasn't harsh. It was based around healthcare, education, religion, and very much on reform. It had workshops for handloom women, um, uh, bobbin winding, wool picking, and rope making. The prisoners earned a wage, apparently, and uh, one-sixth of their earnings was uh, given to them on, on their release. Now, talking of release, and I still think it's sometimes the case today, isn't it? The prisoners that were in there had obviously quite chaotic and difficult lives on the outside. Remember, we're talking late 1700s, early 1800s. It must have been a bit of a hellhole. Um, and quite often they would want to stay in the prison because they had that routine, they had lodgings and they were fed. I don't know, obviously, I, I don't know what it was like in the prison. It might have been horrible, um, but I suppose for some of them it was better than life on the outside. Um, and quite a few of them would hanker uh, uh, on their release date. They would hanker to stay in the prison. So, again, I found a source that <laughs> gave an account of some of the food in the prison. Breakfast, a quart of gruel daily. What exactly was gruel? I'm sure some of you will tell me. Um, so, um, three days of the week, five ounces of boiled beef um, without the bone. A pound of potatoes, seven ounces of brown bread, brown bread, and on Saturdays, stew and onions. I think when they're talking about five ounces of boiled beef and seven ounces of brown bread, I think would that have been over the course of the week? But anyway, like I say, on Saturday, you got uh, stew and onions. And, and then at some point during the week, there was a quart of peas soup. So New Bailey Prison, and that is what we're looking at this prison from 1787. And I looked, I had to stand on the corner of this building site and put the camera just around the gates and I filmed. And I don't know what I was looking at, you know, this old arch buried in the grounds. And then underneath that arch, if you look at it, you'll see like another archway that looks like some kind of tunnel. So God knows what we're looking at here. But like I say, a week later, the whole thing had gone completely. So it's just like, wow, this is the last of the New Bailey prison. Um, and I was privileged enough, and I thank my nephew for sending me the picture and giving me the tip-off. Like I said, there was other digs there. I uh, think Salford Uni did a dig there and uncovered things. And there's they came up with various plan, plans of the prison and everything. But I just felt privileged to see that last bit before it went. So as I'm uh, researching this and looking into this, I found this wonderful poster, Escaped from New Bailey Prison, James Shackleton, on the evening of Thursday, um, the 17th of December, 1795, between 7 and 8 o'clock. I, uh, I bet he was going home for Christmas, you know. 
Uh, anyway, James Shackleton, he was 35 years old, 5 feet 7 and a quarter inches high, dark complexion, thin featured, down looking black flank hair, round shouldered and floops in his walk. Auburn eyes has a cut on the forehead. He was born in Abisher Haves near Blackburn, Lancashire. Whoever apprehends him and lodges him in any of his, what is it, Majesty's jails, will receive a reward of five guineas from the Governor William Dunstan. Um, when he escaped, he had a yellow and blue jacket and a waistcoat and a pair of trousers. So if you see James Shackleton, looks like he's home for Christmas or he's trying to get home for Christmas, you'll get a reward and the reward is five guineas. But well, anyway, it got me to looking at, when I found out about the, the uh, people from um, the Peterloo Massacre that were held there, and I also read about Abel Haywood being held there, I looked at some other famous prisoners, and it got me on another bit of a side story, a very interesting side story. So there were hangings at the prison, and some, one, some famous people that were hang, hung there were the Manchester Martyrs. Um, so I started to look into that. So who were the Manchester Martyrs? Well, that's a, a, an incredibly interesting story. Allow me to explain. So who were the Manchester Martyrs? Well, allow me to set the scene. It's 1867. New Bailey Prison is about to close. It's coming to the end of its life because the prison population is growing. New Bailey can't cope and they're building now up the road Strange Ways Prison. Uh, that's going to open in 1868. Now across town is another prison called the Bellevue Prison and that was near where uh, the Bellevue Pleasure Gardens were later on Hyde Road in Manchester. But anyway, it's 1867 and the Manchester Martyrs were William uh, Allen, Michael O'Brien and Michael Larkin. They were of Irish descent and they were hanged at the New Bailey prison in front of a crowd between 8 and 10,000 people on the 23rd of November 1867. So what happened? Well firstly, William Allen originally was from Cork and was only 18 years of age when he died. Michael Larkin was 32 years old and he was a tailor who lived with his family in Manchester. And Michael O'Brien was 31 years old, again originally from Cork. Uh, he'd also lived in the United States and got to the rank of lieutenant in the US Army. Now, why were the Manchester Martyrs hanged at the New Bailey Prison? Well, let's just go back a bit. They were attempting to free two other gentlemen that had been um, arrested called uh, Thomas Kelly and Timothy Deasy. And they were had links to... Um, it says here, they were important Fenian prisoners. That's what I'm reading here off Wikipedia. So these two gentlemen, Kelly and Deasy, had been arrested. They were in a, a van and being taken up Hyde Road to the Bellevue prison. Um, and the plan was to spring them from the van. Now, when I say van, it was a horse-drawn carriage um, going to the Bellevue prison. So... There was an ambush planned on Hyde Road in Manchester. Hyde Road, Manchester, one of the main arterial routes that lead out the city centre. And here, just underneath this bridge, is a plaque that shows the spot where the ambush took place. So that is the, where the ambush took place on Hyde Road in Manchester. I'll just read you this. At half past three, the van with its accompanying policeman, who was called Sergeant Brett, started out for Bellevue. The plan was that the attackers would hide in and around the arches of the bridge. It would have been a previous bridge to the one that I've shown you, but the same railway. And at a given signal would launch themselves at the van, break open the re rear door, fill, free Kelly and Deasy and spirit them across open fields to Ashton Underline where they would be taken to a safe house. Well, apparently there was absolute chaos. The ambush took place on Hyde Road. Absolute chaos. One of the horses got shot and they were trying to smash their way into the van. Now, there were other prisoners in the van. There was two women and a 12-year-old boy, as well as Kelly and Deasy. Um, a gun was poked through a grill on the van, and Sergeant Brett was shot. 
He didn't die instantaneously, but he lay on the floor. The two women prisoners were commanded to set the keys off him, off him and hand them through the grill, which they did. Uh, the van door was opened and Kelly and Deasy got away. And I think they got away and they eventually got out of the country. Um, but apparently, like I say, it was absolutely chaotic. Uh, Sergeant was taken to hospital where the next day he died uh, from a gunshot wound to the head that had removed an eye from its socket. So that was the end of uh, Sergeant Brett. Now... There was massive anti-Irish feeling at the time and hysteria and the police descended on all the Irish areas of Manchester and rounded up hundreds of men. Um, it's quite a complex story, but eventually there were various men had alibis and a few of them weren't even British citizens. They were from America, but they ended up with the three uh, Manchester martyrs at New Bailey Prison who were condemned to hang. Now, none of the three had actually pulled the trigger and shot Sergeant Brett, but they were condemned to hang at the New Bailey prison. So a gallows was built facing the river and a crowd of between eight and 10,000 gathered. I imagine here, the walls of the prison face the river and in this area here where this road is, a crowd of about eight to 10,000 apparently gathered to watch the hangman do his botched up job. It must have been awful. The crowd, the crowd started gathering uh, the, the evening before because the Manchester Martyrs were to be hanged at uh, early morning. Um, so they gathered the night before and the gin palaces around the prison were kept busy all night. So on the morning of the 23rd of November, 1867, the three Manchester martyrs were taken to the gallows and the crowd fell silent. Now, the hangman, William Calcraft, was apparently um, particularly incompetent and he was notoriously unable to calculate the correct length of rope required for uh, each individual hanging. He frequently had to rush below the scaffold and pull on the victim's legs to hasten death. So we've got a completely incompetent hangman here who's notorious. Obviously, I take it nobody else wanted the job. Uh, it was certainly before the days of Albert Pierpoint because he came later, didn't he? He was a master of uh, hanging people. Anyway, I'm going to read you an account now of the actual hanging. And it's quite harrowing. So when the drop fell, Alan died instantly. But it was soon obvious that Larkin and O'Brien were still very much alive. The drop had been too short and not, infre and not infrequent happening in the executions in those days. Um, the executioner hurried below the scaffold where he hung his full weight around Larkin's legs to finish him off in time. However, he then went over to um, O'Brien and there was a father gad there who forbade the hangmen to touch uh, O'Brien. Um, and so um, gad, Father Gad stood in front of the suspended man offering a crucifix to his twitching fingers and he stood there for three quarters of an hour while O'Brien breathed his last. Later, Father Gad presided over the burial of the three prisoners in the prison grounds. So a botched hanging um, of the prisoners and it sounds quite horrendous. So in Moston Cemetery there is a memorial for the Manchester Martyrs and I went down and I got some footage of it for you. There you go. So I know it's a it's quite a political story, the Manchester Martyrs, and I don't want to get into the politics. I just wanted to tell you it as a story of what happened. Um, obviously, a travesty of justice because the actual killer was never was never found and a botched hanging. And it all ties in with the New Bailey prison. Like I say, 1868, New Bailey closed and Strangeways prison opened. Now, if just to move on from that story, um, something for me personally, a connection in the area. And I'll just finish with this little story, this little side story. 
I've tried to tell this story before, um, uh, tried to make a video about it, but it was a little bit too self-indulgent, so I just abandoned the idea. In 1983, before I started my first ever full-time job, my dad was unemployed, but he had a history of being a milkman, and he was asked to cover um, another man's milk round. This, this gentleman called Bruce had this milk round right in the city centre of Manchester and around that area of Salford in 1983. Like I say, he was called Bruce. He was going off in his holidays for two weeks and he asked me dad, who he must have known, to cover the milk round. And my dad asked me to help him out on the milk round. And I'll tell you now, right? We used to get up at half past three in the morning because we had to hit Manchester. We, were in, we started out in the city centre. We went down Cheetah Mill Road, if you know it. And we hit the city centre, did a little bit around the city centre and then went round to Salford. And we were in that area of New Bailey. Um, we got up at half three in the morning. We was in Manchester about half past five, six o'clock in the morning before the traffic. It nearly killed me that milk round as a 16 year old boy. But talk about prophetic. All that area around there, the River Irwell, New Bailey and everything, I kind of like, I saw this area and I didn't know what I was looking at. I saw the docks, the Manchester docks being pulled down. And I said to my dad, I didn't know Manchester had a docks. He said, oh yeah, Manchester Ship Canal. And I was like, looking at this and, and little did I know that this, these places would enthrall me years later. But at the time, I was completely baffled by it. The docks, I didn't know that Salford was butt up to, to Manchester City Centre. I didn't realise that just across the river, it was Salford. So it was quite a revelation to me. So I won't go on about it. But one of the places we delivered milk to was called Rally Buildings. Rally Buildings. And I just remember pulling into this yard, this car park, in the milk float, and looking at this vast old building and thinking oh my god and my dad said something he said something like right fourth floor such a turn right when you get out of the lift and go down and it's such and such a uh, company and they have four pints four pints of sterile milk uh, that was sterilized milk by the way um, the whole this was a building an old building called rally buildings it had been it had, been, it had been owned by a shipping company, I think, and it was built right on the side of the Irwell. Um, and I went in there, it was an old gate psh, that you closed and you went up. The building by now had been converted into individual um, companies and offices and various workshops. And I delivered milk there, basically. After 1983 and after that glorious two weeks on this difficult but milk round that stuck in my head forever... I think the building got pulled down. I looked for pictures of this and I thought, did I even imagine it? Eventually I found a picture of Raleigh Buildings and it's just across from where I opened this video. Just now stuck in the mythology somewhere in my brain. I had the privilege of going in there. There is a modern day uh, reminder of it. There's a new building there called Rally Keys or something. I'll show you the footage of it now. But I just thought I'd throw that in um, of my memories of that area of just, just down from where the prison was. And also I have to mention at this point, what became of the prison site? Well, it became a yard for the, um, for the railways. I'll just show you a, a, a picture I've got of the yard. This was built smack bang on, this, on the site of, the, uh, of the, the New Bailey prison. So there you go. I'm sorry it was a, a long rambling talky video, but I just had to tell the story of that picture, the New Bailey prison, the Manchester Martyrs, and my connection to that little area in Raleigh buildings, and how it ended up as a, a railway yard. And now it's it's, it's been built on again and the, the, the story continues of that little area. So there you go. Thanks for watching um, and I hope you enjoyed the stories. Uh, take care and I shall see you in the next video. <clears throat> Goodbye.